Good morning. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're reading here the entire Bible together, one chapter at a time, making our way through the book of Isaiah. And uh, I was just reflecting on this the other day. Isaiah is just, it's so big. It's got all these different parts. It's so massive. Um, it, it isn't technically speaking the longest book of the Bible, if you were just to look at word count, but um, just in terms of its breadth and scope, it, it may as well be. And so here we are in these uh, so-called, we were calling them the lost chapters, because they're just all these chapters that you don't see very often, each of them about a different uh, nation and pronouncement of judgment against them. And so this is kind of a two-parter. We're looking last time yesterday at Isaiah 15, today looking at Isaiah 16. It's just the second half of this oracle against Moab, but even though it's just kind of another one, this long series, um, you know, next week we'll be looking at the oracle against Damascus. This one against Moab, it's just, it feels different. It's, it's so, it's so mournful. It's lamenting. God himself seems to be lamenting what's happening here. And, and so it's not without an eye to mercy, even as the destruction seems total. So it's very unique and interesting like that. And it stands out among all the different oracles that we have here. And so getting to ponder some of this with us today and look at some of the, uh, some of these other details we didn't have a chance to look at yesterday. We have Pastor Ken Wagner joining us from Trinity Lutheran Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Good morning, brother. Good to have you back with us. Brother AJ, good to, good morning to you, and it is a delight to be with you. Although everything you said, I am just listening. You're a good teacher. You're a good explainer. How true! Everything you said was is right on target. You know this this was this was almost like a a, a lamentation for me preparing uh, yesterday and today. It kind of brings you into the very heart of God, but it realizes it makes me realize the the depth and the degradation of human sin and right. all, all all that all that more it just extols the grace of god in jesus christ i don't know if you agree with me on that but my goodness it it opens up the world of of human sinfulness but also the mercy of god no i i think um yes i think your your kindness is only matched by your poetic sense i think that absolutely <laughs> you see here that if god is going to be this sympathetic and yet the destruction is going to be so total. Just just think of how bad it had to be for God to be put in the situation where he could not spare right. his hand, right? I mean, just how bad. Yeah. We're going to see this today, just the depth of the depravity that God just could not ignore it anymore. Exactly right. But I'm honored to be with you, and thank you for the invitation, brother. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 great to have you on always. And um yeah, so we we should probably just dive right into this. I think we kind of already set it up yesterday. And so this time it's a little bit longer for us here. Now yesterday was only 9 verses and so today you get like a, a fuller presentation here. You got yeah. 11 verses of poetry followed by a couple of um explanatory verses which are nice to kind of come and see that now. But um yeah. as we begin, would you just pray for us and for everybody listening? Absolutely. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we recognize you as the God of all human history. And you sent your prophets through the past and in the times that were well before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ to warn people, to bring them to a knowledge of your truth, and, Father, to call them back to you. But too often they refuse. We pray, Father, that we may not be like that. Father, always touch us by your Holy Spirit so that we might hear your word, believe it, and truly in faith rejoice in the promises that you have spoken. But we thank you most of all, Heavenly Father, that in the fullness of time you did send forth your Son, the Messiah, the one we'll hear about today, the one prophesied, the one proclaimed and promised in your truth, in your word. You sent your own Son to be the sin bearer for us, and we rejoice in that in that reconciliation, the redemption you have given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, bless our study. We set it apart to you, confident that your Spirit is always there. We ask for your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. All right. Well, let's go ahead and read... Mm. 
I'm thinking maybe just the first two verses because it gives mm -hmm. us just enough to kind of consider the geography and then maybe a little bit of some of like the cultural stuff where it mentions the lamb there. Mm -hmm. So if we can just get started with these first two verses, I'll, uh, I'll let you kind of start introducing things for us. Sound good? Okay. All Indeed. right. All right. Chapter 16, then verse one. Send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah by way of the desert to the mount of the daughter of Zion. Like fleeing birds, like a scattered nest, so are the daughters of Moab at the fords of the Arnon. All right. So, you know, especially just in verse one already, this this takes a turn here. You know, you've got Isaiah taking um, this this imperative form, um, which is I, th I think that's actually been like a little bit different here. But so, what does he mean by um, "send the lamb to to the ruler"? And he mentions here like these two places, Selah and Zion. And neither one of those is in Moab. Yes, and I, I would invite our listeners, even as you hear us talk through it, to to understand that that there is a very very strong historical context and there are there are theological truths there are beautiful promises that god speaks uh in his word that we can kind of all apply we we don't have to put them into a well it applies here and we don't so but my re my real point is to say here we're we're getting into some some specific historical circumstances as well as as uh, places that we'll have to be sensitive to, and I think as listeners and as readers of the Word, we will honor that. Maybe just a quick digression in our in our Lutheran study Bible. I, I reread what Luther has to say, and it was so hmm. interesting. We've we've got it uh, in our Lutheran study Bible there. Luther Luther recognizes that he says, you know, you've got to you've got as you, if you're going to read this and if you're going to be serious about studying God's Word, you're going to have to understand that that Isaiah was speaking to. A specific time. Now, it doesn't mean that the that the promise doesn't go on, and it's it's forever. No, no, no. We're, he he would be the first one to admit that. But he says, take special note of like the introductory sections too, because it's gonna it's gonna give you the framework. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of those uh, cases. So send the lamb. We many readers or listeners might say, well, what in the world does that have to do anything? Well, it has <laughs> everything right. to do because that was a that was a. Um, that was a typical tribute. In fact, we've got we've got documentation from other parts of Scripture and and other, uh, from what I understand, I'm not the expert in archaeology, but other resources that we'll we'll talk about. For example, wasn't it uh, Misha? Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, Misha, when some of the kings so. of Moab that that have to give yes. tribute. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the that's the connection there, mm -hmm. um, and and there were a lot of lambs. I don't remember the amount. Was it like a hundred thousand or something in right. scripture? But uh, but the but the reality is so so this puts us right right into the heart of Moab's existence and their connection to Israel and the historical circumstances of that particular time um, to the ruler of. Of the land, and I, I would argue, you know, that's the that's the bigger Israel context. Or even though Israel is in a bad shape as well, still Isaiah Isaiah is announcing this judgment from God against this nation. And, and brother, one more point: it, it it just struck me, and I mm -hmm. expect you've already mentioned this, but the the origins. And and I am not one. I can still remember a, a Bible class when we were. We were doing um, uh, in the in the book of Genesis. This is years ago, and we we see what happens to Lot in that story. I don't remember the chapter, but uh, the the story of how Lot. Um, it's a it's a terrible it's a terrible scene where the daughters right. sedu seduce him, their father, right. and then both of them become pregnant, and then. You know, it's like ugh, I remember in the mm -hmm. Bible class yeah. that it, it's almost like what a horrible, what a horrible end for Lot. But but that idea that that Lot was always a little bit of defiant and mm -hmm. arrogant, and Abraham tried to work with him and all those kinds of things. But but here here are Lot's descendants, so to speak, right. and um, it it's it's kind of a tough uh, a tough section of scripture. And I can always remember 
some some of the the, the ladies and some of our dear ladies oh, just kind of saying, "Oh my, how could this happen? How could yeah. that have ever happen?" Well, yeah. the scripture explains it. Unfortunately, Lot gets drunk and. And Mm -hmm. uh, so the bottom line is, here we are, hundreds and hundreds of years later, and and that righteous judgment of God is coming true. But it it is it is related to the to the Lamb. It seems to me, and I could be wrong on this, but uh, correct me if I am. But it's the it's the traditional tribute, as we as we say in the note, uh, from the Moabites to to other kings. Go ahead. Let me invite you to please respond. Yeah, no, I think I think I, I really like everything you were saying, and I think it's uh, it's helpful that you bring out. You know, this is poetry, and so um, it literally literally doesn't even say send the lamb. It just kind of says send lamb. Um, send and, lamb, right? Huh? R- right, and, and that's just a poetic shorthand here for as you were saying, not just one lamb, but their expected tribute, which would have been quite a quite a few. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and this is this is just how it worked that. If you were a what well, the the term is used like a vassal nation or a vassal kingdom, mm. if you were kind of yeah. one of these subordinate kingdoms that kind of had to um, show respect and pay up for the big guy in the area, um, then that yeah. was kind of the relationship between the Moabites and um, the kingdom of Judah here that yeah. Judah expected tribute from them. Um, this is what you would do. Um, and of course, this is like where we saw earlier in Isaiah, the problem arises because the Assyrians start asking for tribute from Judah. And that's kind of how this whole thing gets set off um, that we see later on. And so, yeah, so the idea, and, and of course, um, you, you see that just in the in typical like Hebrew fashion here in the poetry here, when it says, send the lamb to the ruler of the land, um, and then from Selah, to Zion, there's the parallel, right? The ruler of the land yeah. is in Zion. It's the king who is in Zion in Jerusalem, right? Yeah. Um, and where are they sending from? Well, this is the interesting thing. Someone might be saying to themselves, now hang on a second. All that stuff about them having, you know, being sheep herders and all that, what's that matter? Um, the Debon has been turned into blood and everything's been totally wrecked and destroyed. So how are they sending a tribute? The tribute is coming, it says, from Sela, which is actually a city in Edom. And so this is, um, you know, you were mentioning the Lutheran Study Bible, brother, fantastic resource because, among other things, it has maps. And so if you look at some of those maps, it shows you just how, you know, you've got Israel up to the north, you've got Judah in the south, across from the Dead Sea from Judah, you've got Moab, and then further down to the south, you've got Edom. And so as this Assyrian tidal wave is just coming from the east and from the north, sweeping down and destroying everything, destroying Damascus, destroying Israel, destroying Moab, the Moabites have, at least some of them, have fled down to Edom, and they're now asking for help of Jerusalem, of Judah, um, from this place of um, just escape and refuge down south. And and it points out one more time um, the way that the Lord God, the the ruler of all the nations, and and this is where I tend to get theological and and uh, more, um, you may say spiritual, but but this this is the this is the Lord's purpose, and I know we had we had probably seen that before, but God is always uh, bringing about His purpose. God is God is in control here. Um, the people have to flee. The people, res- you know, they they run away. All those different uh, types of um, gestures to try to get out of the out of the wrath but it's going to happen Mm -hmm. it will it will happen and and yet it strikes me that you know here here's one one more instance where uh, it 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 just it it talks about the heart of god and and the mercy of god but but his purposes will be accomplished his purposes will come to pass Right. And, and you mentioned, too, um, like the spiritual condition of the Moabites. And, and we see, we're going to see here more in chapter 16, what we saw in verse 15, or chapter 15, that, that pride plays a large part in this. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah. pretty much yes. in all of these oracles, there is a, there is a condemnation against human pride, um, and, right. which is why you have to have this, this humbling. And in many respects, it seems like there's nothing more humbling for any nation to have to become uh, go, to go from having their own nation 
to having to be refugees in exactly. a different place. And right. in, in that like position... Like birds, right? Go ahead. Yeah, they're fleeing. They're fleeing like a scattered nest. It's, exactly. It's a beautiful... It's an awful picture, but it's a, it is. it's a picture that gives you insight into how they experienced mm-hmm. this time of God's judgment, anyway. Right. So God is judging them, and, and it's working for his purposes to humble the proud here. And, you know, I just... Um, I'm remembering... Well, I mean, first of all, this is interesting, right? So here they are. They've, they've, they've uh, flown south, right, to Edom. Yeah. And they're petitioning mm-hmm. Judah, as it were, to grant asylum, to grant refuge. Yes. And so it, this is, this is um, I mean, my goodness, I just I can't help but think of, you know, there are lots of people who, for instance, they go to Mexico from all over the world. And then from Mexico, they're like, okay, can we, can we get in the United States, you know? Um, you 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 get to a place along the way um, that's better than the the chaos that you just came from, but you're trying to get to a really good place, right? And and yeah. so in this case, yeah. that really good place that people are trying to get to is Judah. You know, that's where mm-hmm. they, that's where they really want to wind up. And that's well, where they're going to feel yeah. the most secure. Yes, 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 and we'll see that in just the next couple of verses as well. Right, right. I was just, um, you know, one last kind of anecdotal thought, and because um, I don't, I won't spend much time on it because I wonder how many people have actually seen the movie. But there was a movie that I really liked. I, I like some of these disaster movies. Um, one's it's called uh, "The Day After Tomorrow," and it's one of these where, um, just oh, yeah, um, yeah every, everything just goes just goes totally upside down, and and uh, it's like climate change happens like overnight. It's just it all overnight. happens. Like, yeah, sure, super, I remember. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's There's all these one. big super storms, and it's just it's just crazy, right? <laughs> And so the big thing, right. basically, in the end, spoiler alert, okay, um, so just cover your ears <laughs> if you want to see the movie. It's an old, it's already, like, you know, got 10 years on it at least. Um, yes. Probably probably more. But basically, it's a new ice age. And so everyone who's up in the United States has to literally go down south to Mexico. South, isn't it? That's the irony, isn't it? Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and so, and so the, I remember that there's this final scene where, like, the president is giving this speech from Mexico, and he's like just saying how mm-hmm. you know we who you know once like had everything are now guests and refugees in what we used to call the third world, right? right. And just how humbling is that when right. um, the the tables are turned like this, and when and when you have uh, Moab having to go down south to Edom like that. Yes, exactly right. That's a great analogy. I know I know that movie, and I remember it very well, and. <laughs> I think it had probably some, uh, oh, can I say cultural and other political, but it's, it's a fun <laughs> sure, movie to watch. Sure. Right, it's yeah, yeah, movie. of course. Yeah. But anyways, let's go, let's go ahead and read the next few verses like you were already alluding to as, as we kind of um, you know, understand this idea of asking for refuge. So just the next three verses here. Give counsel, grant justice, make your shade like night at the height of the of noon shelter the outcasts do not reveal the fugitive let the outcasts of moab sojourn among you be a shelter to them from the destroyer when the oppressor is no more and destruction has ceased and he who tramples underfoot has vanished from the land then a throne will be established in steadfast love and on it will sit in faithfulness in the tent of david one who seek, one who judges and seeks justice and is swift to do righteousness so so yeah now now there's this imperative here which doesn't seem to be directed to um you know the moabites that they would send right. their tribute but this now seems to be talking about what what Judah is supposed to do that Judah should do this for them Yes and it's always interesting to me and and I re- I defer to the experts but I can alert our readers if you if you take a little bit of time and slow down you can notice things, for example, like quote marks, quotation marks there, mm-hmm. too. Um, and then it takes, I think the quotation mark takes us all the way down uh, to the end of five. And then, and then there's another section that I hope we'll be able to get to. But, but even the quote marks will, the quotation marks will alert us to um, something different, so to speak. And I know that I mean that there are probably different interpretations, but is is this is this like a um, a request from from uh, from kind of like the Moabites personified that that they are making this a 
of ultimately of God, but ultimately, I mean, immediately through through Judah. In other words, does this come to Judah? It seems to me, as I was preparing for it, I I, I got that sense that this is coming to um, this is almost like a plea, a plea. But it but I could also understand, brother, and I I respect your counsel on this. Speaking of giving counsel, I would re, I would respect what you say in terms of is this God. Is this God speaking as well? Anyway, somebody is speaking mm-hmm. here, and it could be more of like a, a plea, a humble plea, um, right. because that's the way the, the NIV takes it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's interesting. Um, it's not in the original. <laughs> right. And, and you know, that, you know, but um, render a decision, grant justice. This would be like a hypothetical plea from from the, the leaders or the people, you know, Moab mm-hmm. personified to Judah saying, please, please let us stay there. Um, let our, let our refuge, uh, refugees or fugitives be among you. And then, and then of course, there's, there's this a sense that there is a, there's a, a bigger truth going on that Judah is the one from whom the, the the true Messiah, the real mm-hmm. ruler, in the midst of all this um, uh, judgment, righteous judgment, exercised by God through these pagan rulers, but there's one who is going to sit on the throne in righteousness, and he's going to be of the house of David. And of course, you know, Moab would have known all those things. If, if the leaders I'm talking about, they would have known it, but, but he... So I, w- I would defer to you. I'm going to invite you, please, to uh, to counsel me on this one. I'm I'm torn. I really am torn. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think I'm right there with you. That you know, obviously, like you were saying, w- those quotation marks are added by kind of the, the experts who sit on those translation committees. Uh, there are no quotation marks in the Hebrew. The Hebrew, when you look at the manuscripts, is just a string of <laughs> letters. There's not even necessarily spaces between the words. So um, it is a matter of interpretation, right? Um, though I, I think in this case, um, the interpretation seems pretty solid that this would be a plea from the the Moabites. In fact, um, in, in, in a certain level, you know, like... Uh, what you have in verse one, like the from Selah to the Mount of the Daughter of Zion, it it it, it almost kind of like gets your mind open to that they're sending um, not just tribute, but like a letter or something like that, yeah. right? Or, yeah. or you know, well, some well, kind through, of through uh, an message. emissary, for example. Ex- yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right, mm-hmm. exactly. So I, I think that all of that is is a good supposition. But even if you took this as God, um, which is a provocative way of thinking about it. Mm. Um, it, that's not entirely different from the Moabites speaking the words that God wants them to speak. Because again, exactly. God is humbling them through the Assyrians. This is what he wants for them. He wants them to be humble. He wants them yeah. ultimately to find shelter under his Messiah. So whether this is kind of God talking directly or as is, I think, more probable as you've laid out for us, um, the Moabites themselves speaking the words that God has has wanted them to speak for some time yeah. now. Um, I think that either yeah. way you kind of end up in a similar sort of position. I agree. That that makes that makes real good sense to me. And so again, I remind our our listeners to to understand that that this is a this is a specific context here, and I can well imagine um, the leaders coming and, and begging, you know. To go right back to the day after tomorrow, I think uh, that's a you know there was a in the movie, if I remember correctly, there was kind of a plea uh, in a in a negotiation for um, citizens of North America, mm. to come, you know, the United States to to be able to migrate south. Remember, yeah. remember that, and there was yeah. some give and take on, and so you can just picture it mm-hmm. in, in a disaster movie like that, but. But it also it's also occurring at this particular time, and yet and yet God is behind all of it. And, and right. but but what I what I'd love to to get to, and I know we're probably getting close to the end of our of our time right here. But yeah. oh, then the throne will be established. 
and steadfast yeah, yeah, love. Oh, wow. You know, yeah, we, we got we got to talk time. about that. Like you said, it's time for a <laughs> break, but we'll we'll get there right after we come back from the break. Everybody, hang on. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 16, the second part of this oracle against Moab here on Thy Strong Word. We'll be right back. The story of Worldwide KFUO is a tale of technology. Radio was new in 1924 when KFUO was born to serve Christ the Savior. Now, KFUO is still finding new broadcast technologies so we can spread the gospel to the world via the web, smartphones, tablets, and new intelligent speaker devices. And when the next big thing is unveiled, we'll be there too. Broadcasting the good news at the forefront of technology, we are Worldwide KFUO. This is Pastor Brian Wolfmuller inviting you to join me every Monday afternoon on Cross Defense, 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock here on KFUO Radio, where we take up curious topics, curious Christian topics, to excite our imaginations, equip our minds, and comfort our consciences with the supreme and beautiful clarity of God's Word. It happens on Cross Defense every Monday afternoon, 2 to 3, here on KFUO. Please make plans to join us. And if you can't join us live, check out the podcast at kfuo.org. I'm Pastor Ken Bomberger. Join me weekday mornings at 7.15 for Orazio, your time of scripture, meditation, and music on KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Welcome back, everybody, to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa, and we're joined today by Pastor Ken Wagner, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. We're looking at the second half of this Moab oracle here in Isaiah chapter 16, and we were we were just looking at this section between verses 3 and 5, understanding this plea coming out from Moab that they would be able to take refuge in an asylum and, and sojourn in Judah. Um, and, and we're getting to this point here, talking about the, the mention of David here in verse 5. And I think there's something, there's really something, besides just the awesome poetry that's here, there's something very poetic about the whole idea. Um, but before before we get there, I just want to make sure that I invite everybody listening live, if you are listening live here, Friday, the October the 4th here, you can call in live, 314-821-0850, if you're in St. Louis. Or if perhaps you're uh, over in Indiana or elsewhere, 1-800-730-2727. Or you can always send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. So if you have a question or a comment or you you think of uh, something like, for instance, what I'm going to bring up here, think of Ruth. Um, Because we mentioned Mm. this last time. But I, I just I just wonder just how much of this is being deliberately invoked here because you've got this great poetry you know make your shade like night at the height of noon yeah I mean that, that I know that's where you're just going. That's just beautiful. I mean, it, to me, yeah. I, I don't. I don't know if um, Ken. I don't. I don't know, brother. If you had an opportunity to observe this, but did you see that that full total um, eclipse that we had a couple of years ago? Um. No, I did not, and I can't remember if it was cloudy around here or whatever the case would be. But I remember I saw. Was it neat? Oh, it was. It was just amazing. It was. It was fantastic. I know that. Like my my wife and I, we we were there, um, and we took took our little girl Ellie. Um, who, I mean, who was just. I mean, to just learn to walk yeah. basically, and we were all there, and we had our like. Um, we actually had big welding goggles that we bought that could just to be strong <laughs> and safe, right? But I remember when that moon went right because we we were actually in a spot in Missouri where you had. Uh, I, I feel like it was like almost like ten minutes of total eclipse. Um, it wow. was just, it was so weird when that moon came in front of the sun like that. Instantly it felt cooler. I mean, a lot cooler. Yeah. Cause it was, a, it was like right. during the summer and all of a sudden it feels cool. 
all the birds stopped. Everything just wow. stopped, like like just on a dime like that. Um, and then everywhere you looked in every direction, it just looked like in every direction, like twilight. Like it was like the sun was setting in 360 degrees. It was bizarre. And I mean, it, but it was in the middle of the day, in the middle of summer. And I, and I feel like that image, make your shade like night at the height of yeah. noon. Of you, noon. You're, 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 at, you're asking for something like an eclipse. You're asking for something like the moon to come and do something dramatic in the midst of something that's really powerful and really hot, like the sun, which is in this case representing the Assyrians. So, Yes, exactly, uh, brother. I'm right. I'm tracking you 100%. And, and it's almost like um, a plea. It's, but not only, not only the, uh, the beauty, the evocative power of the language, but, but this, was, this was almost like um, I'm really su- We're suffering. We are really mm-hmm. suffering at, at the hands of... Could Israel? Would you please be like shade and, yeah. and and spread it all out all over us? And I mean, the analogy works perfectly. Uh, but but again, to our listeners, the, these are heartfelt. These are heartfelt um, pleas coming out. Uh, this this wasn't. This is just some fancy poetry. This, this is a real request. But um, I, you know, one one of the other things too. And I went. I, I did. I can only uh, thank you for bringing that up. It it seems to me that you are absolutely right. This is from Moab as a whole, so to speak, personified. Right. But but there's also a, a sense that that Israel becomes, and I hope I don't spread this too thin here. Israel is like representing the church, hmm. and and that's that's where uh, the presence and the grace of God is. Uh, among his beloved people, and so the church becomes a place of refuge, uh, and and the you know the nations want to come into that, and that's that's something. It, I'm not saying it as clearly as I should, but but uh, the church, you know, coming to faith. I think a lot of the the church fathers, and in the past, uh, throughout the history of the church, we've we've recognized that the that the church, you know, this this uh, body of believers. They're they're like a shelter in in the midst of this a uh, hot oppressive world and you know come to Christ come to come to the truth but also find your relief find your salvation find your your comfort yeah. in the midst of you know and so and and that's where I'm I'm just thinking in terms of uh, these people really I'm, I'm talking about the Moabites in particular and the leadership they recognize that Israel is the place this the Lord God is with them the Lord God is is in their midst and this is the only shelter we we can find at this point because on our own we right. cannot we cannot withstand the assyrians yeah no i think i think you're you're, you're spot on that the, the thing is like the church is totally unique it's singular you know we we, we say it in the creed yeah. there is one holy yeah. uh christian church i mean and, that, and that's just the thing like 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 you know uh, in the middle of a hot st louis summer day the only thing um, the only thing in nature that's going to like all of a sudden like happen and come between you and the sun in a, in a moment, give you shade like night. I mean, it is like a full total eclipse, right? There's something, it's, it's yeah. singular. There's only one thing that's going to yeah. do that. If it gets cloudy, right. it's still going to be hot. And everyone in St. Louis yeah. knows what a hot, uh, <laughs> muggy summer day is like. There's only right. one thing that's going to do that. And so similarly here, there's only one thing that's going to give them shade like night. There's only one thing, and, and that is um, the people of God. Um, who in this yeah. case are are the you know you, what you could call the BC Church in the people yeah. of Judah and, and what's unique too about them and, and this is this is the thing that I wonder right if 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 this is getting at the idea of the unique story and relationship not the not the <clears throat> unique relationship that we saw in the story of Genesis 19 right um, which you mentioned right. earlier um, which is of course the chapter about the the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and just how um. Even after Lot and his daughters left Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, there was a little bit of Sodom and Gomorrah, you might say, in them still. What's going on that, in there, yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You can take them out of Sodom, but you can't take the Sodom out of Lot, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So well so you, you, you have that going on. But no, the other story of the relationship between Moab and the people of God, which is the story of Ruth, because, I mean, we, yeah. we saw this in chapter 15. The, the primary thing that's driving the Moabites away is the Assyrians. The Assyrians are just a wrecking ball, and they're just destroying everyone in the region. But we saw also 
There was mention what? Um, this is It was back in verse 6 of chapter 15. It says, The waters of Nimrim are a desolation. The grass is withered. The vegetation fails. The greenery is no more. And, and surely those things all could happen because of, you know, massive armies marching through. But that could be, could be, a description of a drought and a famine yeah. that's just exacerbating everything, that's just making it even worse. And so... This is this is poetic. Then uh, this is like poetic justice, you might say, or it's just poetic in God's providence. Is it the case that Moab now, because of a drought and a famine, is seeking to sojourn among Israel, among particularly Israel. Judah and the house of David? Because if that's the yeah. case, that's exactly what happened in the story of Ruth when Ruth, the family of Naomi. Was 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 suffering in Bethlehem because there was a famine, and they became sojourners in Moab, right? And so, and, and as a result, Obed was born, who was the grandfather of David. So, I mean, is David the poetic key that's like, that's holding all of this together? Yes, yes, and I I agree with that. It, it, but but see, those are the historical dimensions, and you have to understand the entirety of the story, the biblical story, and then it comes to its its glorious conclusion in in the ancestor. I'm sorry, in the descendant, not the ancestor. Obed is the ancestor, but in the descendant of King David, who will do righteous. He will do seek all those beautiful things and you know Isaiah's going to uh the prophet Isaiah the prophet will explain those and proclaim those in so many different ways one one other note one other quick note is um that there's the there's the assurance that the that the oppressor will be no more and mm-hmm. and that's one more time of the judgment of God God is the is the lord of all human history. So uh, just as God will bring judgment on Moab, God will also bring judgment on the Assyrians, and the Assyrians will be uh, put to shame, to you know, right. use, use that kind of a language. But there is one kingdom, there is one king who will last forever, and I think that's probably um, where we have to, we have to make sure our, our listeners hear that so beautifully. Then a throne will be established. Um, the throne is established. God establishes the throne. Men don't establish the throne. God establishes the eternal throne um, from the tent of David. We could go on. Uh, just It's a beautiful, I think, I am quite convinced, and I think we do this uh, very well in our study Bible and and in, in our messages and so on, all of Scripture, all of the Old Testament is pointing to that, to that fulfillment of the promise that God has made to his people, his beloved people, that he will send the anointed one. He will bring to pass the birth of his Messiah. And it comes to its glorious conclusion. Of course, in the opening pages, you go right to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. It, is, it just starts out right there, doesn't right. it? All, all, this, all this history mm-hmm. has been, been brought to its glorious fulfillment. And, and it, mentions, it mentions Ruth, among other people. And, and I think yeah. that, that, you know, so as you were saying, there, there's going to be a, a local fulfillment in this typology here. We've talked about this before, yeah. that there's this local fulfillment. And yet, yeah, the, the Assyrian siege is going to be broken. And Hezekiah, who is um, a descendant yes. of David, is going to of rule David. and preside over peace in his time. Mm-hmm. But as you were saying, this is pointing ahead to the to the ultimate fulfillment. And, and so think think about this. This is the cool thing, right? When you understand the historical stuff, it tells you more about Jesus. Because if this is what's going on, that in a sense, David's ancestors, right, were sojourning among the Moabites in order that one day the Moabites would be able to sojourn and dwell sojourn. among among un, under David and un, among the people yeah. of Judah. And if David is the one who's prefiguring Christ, think about that, that one day the, the true and ultimate Christ would sojourn among us, that we yeah. would then one day be able to dwell in the true and heavenly Jerusalem. I mean, I mean this, right. is, this is actually foreshadowing the incarnation that Christ had to come down and, and dwell like a stranger, 
right? Because, you know, he who was in the form right. of God, he who was, you know, from heaven, the bread from heaven, like our Lord says in, in John chapter 6, right? He had to leave in some sense his celestial home like a sojourner, like the way that Naomi and her family went to Moab, and he dwelt with us in humility as they did. And, and because of that... Right. We are then able to, when the material and worldly wealth and all of the things that we rely on fail, when this world is rolled up like a scroll, and when when the famine of of the, the of I mean of the end times really hits this created order, we then go to that we go north to the heavenly Judah, the <laughs> heavenly Jerusalem. Yeah. In Christ, I mean, I mean, like, like that whole movement is foreshadowed in this story of of Ruth and then Moab here during the Assyrian crisis. I agree, and it's a. I hope this is really comforting for those who are listening, because um, even in the midst of our problems and the pain that you are experiencing, and I see it here as a as a pastor, and I know you do too, brother. But but you see the hurt and the um, there's a there's a dear family their their mother is declining in the in the midst of a of a struggle with dementia and so on and they're hurt and then you put into that another i'm not going to mention any names of course but you put in a, a great nephew who has um, struggled with with addictions and overdosed and so on in the midst of the opioid crisis here and and i see it and and yet you know you Where's your only hope? And this, this is the neat thing. I, I can speak to this family, and they're strong believers, and they're they are committed. They're absolute committed to the to the promises of God. And you know, where's your hope in these in these uh, difficult moments? Well, it has to be in the Lord. But but the movement that you describe, He's the one who came into our lives first, and right. and He will bring us through, and then prepare us as he as he's already done prepare us for for that heavenly jerusalem so all of this and if you can get that brothers and sisters those of you who are listening to me if you can get this framework this perspective on reading the scriptures it'll come alive to you it'll it'll open up and and i i think this is where you get great comfort even in the midst of the judgment of god that goes on in this world sometimes it's immediate with with the uh, with for example Moab here God God is and we're going to see that if we get to it uh, in just a few moments sometimes it's simply a matter of the fact that we live in this fallen world and we have to deal with all the consequences of of sin and brokenness and and I see it you see it but brothers and sisters out there don't miss the promises of God in in spite of it all right yeah there 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 is as you were as you were saying brother there there is something that god has prepared for us for the future there is a place of refuge that we will be able to go to but there is something even in the present like you were saying that that this judah is already found in the church and that there is a place of refuge even in the midst of the storm even in the midst of the destruction of something as terrible as the assyrians i mean because man you talk about you know different nations of the world today that are bad I mean, right. the Assyrians, I mean, these guys were, these guys were really bad. Um, right. I mean, it, it puts, yeah. our, puts our modern con, my context kind of to uh, nothing, so to speak. Yeah, from, yeah, from no, what I've that, read. that's yeah. right. And so, so definitely uh, amidst all the different things that you were naming, just the, the, the travails of life, there, there is a place of refuge in the church of, of Jesus yeah. Christ, um, who Amen. is the true heir of David. Um I, and I'm glad that we took some time. It was, I think it was good to look at those first two verses because those set up the context. I think it was good to focus here on verses three through five because, I mean, this is, this is the thing that, that points ahead to the gospel most clearly. Um, the rest of the chapter, um, six through, what is it, 14 here, um, I, I think it's good then to go ahead and read the rest of the chapter. It is a little bit more on the condemnation and the destruction. So it's a longer section, and there's a lot of different things that we could observe about it. Um, but it does kind of belong together. So I'll go ahead and read the rest of the chapter, and that way we'll still have a good chunk of a few minutes here to, to make some more observations and concluding remarks yeah. on this uh, oracle as it comes down to an end. So here we are picking it up at verse 6. We have heard of the pride of Moab 
how proud he is of his arrogance, his pride, and his insolence, and his idle boasting, he is not right. Therefore, let Moab wail for Moab. Let everyone wail, mourn, utterly stricken, for the raisin cakes of kir For the fields of Heshbon languish, and the vine of Sibma, the lords of the nations have struck down its branches, which reached to Jazer and strayed into the desert. Its shoots spread abroad and passed over the sea. Therefore I weep with the weeping of Jazer for the vine of Sibma. I drench you with my tears, O Heshbon and Elale, for over your summer fruit and your harvest the shout has ceased, and joy and gladness are taken away from the fruitful field. And in the vineyards no songs are sung, no cheers are raised, no treader treads out wine in the presses. I have put an end to the shouting. Mm. Therefore my inner parts moan like a lyre for Moab, and my inmost self for Kir Hareseth. And when Moab presents himself, when he wearies himself on the high place, when he comes to his sanctuary to pray, he will not prevail. This is the word the Lord spoke concerning Moab in the past. But now the Lord has spoken, saying, In three years, like the years of a hired worker, the glory of Moab will be brought into contempt, in spite of all his great multitude, and those who remain will be very few and feeble. And that's where the oracle, the burden, so yep. to speak, about Moab comes to a close. I think, again, you uh, set it up so beautifully at the very beginning. This, The language, the, the poetic uh, language, takes us into um, like the joy and the celebration at a, at a time of harvest. So that mm-hmm. would be like the context. So if you can, like if I, I had a wedding. I had a wedding up in uh, Michigan, as a matter of fact, over the mm. weekend. So we, a long, long story, uh, a young man and his, his new bride now, I had gotten to know him. And, of course, you, 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 this, that is a, always a joyful celebration. Uh, oh, yeah. And I sit, I sit at the table, and I watch the dancing, and they do the chicken dance and all of <laughs> that. You know how that goes, <laughs> too. But it sure is a lot of fun. It, you know, it's joy, and people are singing, and it, it's just a time of celebration. Of course, right. now that's, that's, that's like one, one uh, context in the ancient world as well as our own. But mm-hmm. in this, the, the whole context is, um, can, can you imagine the joy? Hey, this is a great harvest. We celebrate. Thank you, God. You know, and of course, it wasn't always to the, to the appropriate God. Right, I understand right. that. But, but the reality is that this is, this is a natural occurrence. And then, of mm-hmm. course, the prophet turns that around, um, there's no harvest. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no harvest. And all, all, all they hear, so to speak, is, is weeping. Um, Oh, I mean, it was it was once a, a a grand nation, so to speak. It was once, a, you know, the 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 branches or the shoots are going out and so on. But but right now, um, the summer fruit, the heart, well, nobody's shouting. Why? Of of course, because God's judgment is taking place, and mm-hmm. in the vineyards, you know, joy and gladness are taken away from the fruitful field. Um, and I and I, you know, let's not for our listeners let's not understand that um, moab was like a, a fruitful spiritual people but i think this this just operates on the on the level of right um you, you know you can help me out on this it's just kind of like a a picture of yeah. this is how human beings yeah. would celebrate a harvest mm-hmm. um, right. not that they were a, i'm not talking about a spiritual harvest but right now um with with the judgment of God through mm-hmm. Assyria, no songs are being sung, no cheers right. are raised. Right. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Does that, that make that, sense? Am I right? yeah, on the right yeah, track? Yeah. No. That, that's a really helpful comparison because we did see back in Isaiah five there was a song of the vineyard, and, and there the vineyard was actually, and, and uh, you know, it's like this: "I will sing of my beloved." Right. And we actually talked about that that idea of kind of like yeah. a wedding reception at, at a winery or something like that. Right. Yeah. You know, they're they're among the vines. Right. Um, you know, a popular thing to do these days, uh, certainly. And it's, you know, it's a fitting place, you know, be, wine, grapes. I mean, that's just one of the kind of original symbols of joy, right? Yes, um, th- but there are some similarities 
um, because there the vineyards also destroyed um, by the Assyrians. Um, but there, there's a big difference, like you were saying, because there, you know, the Lord plants this vineyard, it, he says, right. um, and he expects a, a harvest, but there's wild grapes, right? And so the problem is that the harvest yeah. is not the right kind, and there's a spiritual problem, right? Here, yes. there, there's no description of uh, the Lord planting this, like that this was his vineyard, um, that the, right. you know the, that he was expecting you know good grapes, but he said he got wild grapes. There, there's none of that stuff. This is just as you were saying, just a description of the material uh, reversal that we're going to have. Yes. One moment there's going to be a, a, like vines that that it says are, are reaching all over the place. They 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 go all the way up to Jazer and like they they're just so bountiful that they're, they're going out into the desert even they, they reach the out desert, into the right. wilderness. Mm-hmm. So so it's you, know, the, you think of this vine language that the vines are are plentiful, bountiful, lots of summer fruit, lots of harvest. Um, it says there the raisin cakes right in verse seven. You know that sounds maybe odd to us, but you got to remember this is how the only way you could pretty much make anything sweet was to add fruit to it. You didn't have a sugar cane <laughs> out, right. out there. You didn't, you didn't have a high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> so, so if you were going to make things all these, sweet... All these new products, aspartame, <laughs> whatever they're on. Yeah, right. <laughs> so if you were going to make something sweet, if you are going to have any kind of dessert, you know, like this like this good celebration feast food, like a wedding cake, right? You were mm-hmm. going to use raisins, pretty much, or, right. or, or some other fruits, maybe pomegranate, right? And so this is, this is your feast food, your festival food. This is your good stuff, right? This is the stuff at the wedding reception, and no Indeed. more. the the the, the bounty right. is reversed, um, and it's, it's all it's destroyed. Over. That's right. That's exactly right. And um, do you sense too? And and I, you know, it's always been good to get into these. You you got to linger on them for a little while. But verse nine, for example, verse eleven. Here's here's where God um, interjects his heart, so to speak. Yeah. Um, therefore, I weep. Um, God sees human beings destroyed. Um, it, it breaks his heart, metaphorically speaking, but it is the righteous judgment of God. But that, that just, in, for example, in verse 11, therefore my inner parts moan like a lyre from Moab, mm-hmm. And my inmost self for Kir Haraseth. But um, I, I just, this is what we, we started on for our listeners. We started on this. this. This is like the heart of God. This is this is where God weeps. A God does not desire anyone to be lost. Right. You know, and you can go to Ezekiel. I'm, I'm thinking um, Paul even. Paul recognizes that God wants all people to be saved, and there, there is this profound um, sense of loss of His creation. We are there's still His beloved creation, His beloved people, His children. We're all children. That's what we confess in our catechism. Every human being is made in the image of God. We're all His children. He wants all of His children to be saved, but but that's the the wandering. That's the rejection that human beings do. And, of course, it all starts with, uh, you know, know, kind of, oh, by the way, remember, we've heard this before, the pride that Mm -hmm. Moab exhibits, how proud he, arrogance, his insolence, idle boasting, idle boasting, and yet God still weeps for his rejected children. Wow. You know, A.J., that, you've got, I mean, don't, don't, don't let people tell us today that God doesn't care for for all people. No, that that's no, kind of hard and parcel of who right. we are as Lutheran. God yeah, that's there. right. You know, he he re- he has to stretch out his hand in judgment, but in his heart of hearts, he wants them to take refuge in the Messiah and his in, in descend into the heir of David. Amen, amen. Ah, all out of time. Thank you so much, brother. Always, always a pleasure to have you on, and I think we are going to have you on soon. So I'm looking forward to that. 
Thank you, my friend. I am always honored. God bless you, and thanks for the important work you do on behalf of the church. You've been listening to Thank you. Uh, blessings and peace, everybody. That was Pastor Ken Wagner, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Thanks for tuning in this week. we got more Isaiah next week as we go through these oracles against the nations. Check out our underwriters at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, lhfmissions.org. I'm Pastor A.G. Espinosa. Until next time, peace. By Strong Word.